Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Last Sunday we talked about what should be planted in our church garden. And uh, Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. And since that's true, what should we be planting? We said that our garden should contain three rows of peas. A presence, we need to all be here every opportunity we have. Purpose, we need to remember why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing, and prayer. And we'll talk more about prayer uh, in today's lesson even. Three rows of squash. We should squash indifference. We shouldn't uh, just show up and, and sit in the pew. We should be active in our worship, active in our service. Squash sharp tongues. Be careful what you say. Somebody said always keep your words soft and sweet because you never know when you're going to have to eat them. And that we should squash gossip. And our rule for that was to think before you talk. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If it's not, then we need to squash it. Uh, then we talked about we needed three rows of turnips. We need to turn up with a smile. Uh, joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we read about. Uh, we need to turn up with enthusiasm. Paul said that we're to be fervent in spirit and zealous of good works. And we need to turn up with an open Bible and an open mind. If I say something up here, you need to look in your Bible, make sure it's the truth. But if it's true, then you need to do what the Bible says do. This morning, we're going to add something else to our garden. You may have heard the old joke where the, the teacher assigned the spelling words and told the kids to, to write sentences with them. And one of the words was fascinate. The little boy says, my coat has nine buttons, but I can only fascinate. And that wasn't exactly what she had in mind. Another little girl said, uh, I hope the teacher will, the word was lettuce, and she said, I hope the teacher will let us out of school early today. Well, that's the kind of lettuce we're going to be talking about today uh, that we need to add to our garden. So this morning, we're going to talk about six rows of lettuce. And most of this lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, uh, predominantly from chapter four. So let's start there. Hebrews chapter four, verse one. The first lettuce we're going to look at this morning is let us fear. Hebrews 4.1 said, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. He said the people had been given the message of hope. They had received the gospel. They received a promise of rest. But the Hebrew writer said he was afraid that some of them we're going to receive the reward. He feared that they would come short. Why? Well, they'd heard the word, but he said their hearing was not mixed with faith. Does that mean they heard it and they didn't believe it? No, it meant they heard it and they didn't act like they believed it. They didn't do anything. They didn't change their lives. Basically, he's saying you heard the gospel. You said you obeyed, uh, that you believed the gospel, not obey the gospel. Fear of the Lord is something that's repeated throughout the Bible. It's especially a prevalent in the Proverbs. Turn to the book of Proverbs. And let's look at a few times that the proverb writer tells us we need to fear the Lord. Let's start in Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. He said, you want to learn something? You want to know something? The first thing you need to know is, Fear God. If you don't fear God, then you really don't want to gain wisdom. You don't really want to gain knowledge. And he calls people that do that, or that don't do that, fools. So fear God if you're not foolish. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> Proverbs 3, beginning in verse 5, says this. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It says if you fear the Lord, you're going to stay away from things that will hurt us. If you fear the Lord, you're going to stay away from evil things. And that idea is better explained in our next one. Look at Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. 
This writer says that fearing the Lord means you hate evil. You hate all these evil things. And he said that the froward mouth is one of the things that he hates. Well, froward's not a word we use a lot, but it means difficult to deal with, stubborn. Uh, the proverb writer said he hated mouths that talked that way. Why? Because he feared the Lord. He said, if you fear the Lord, you'll hate evil. Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14, verse 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Basically, it says if you fear God, you don't have to worry about anything. You can put your trust in him. Look at the next verse. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Sin has condemned all of us to eternal damnation, but if you fear God, you can escape that death. There are a lot more, but you get the idea. If we want to be wise, if we want to be safe, if we want to have eternal life, then let us fear the Lord. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Very well-known passage, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fearing God is half of our purpose on earth. Half of our duty is let us fear God. But that's not the whole verse. I'll read it again. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if we truly fear God, we're going to do what he tells us to do. And that gets us to our second let us. Let us labor. Go back to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 11 says this, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. In other words, let us fear God so much that we do what he tells us to do. If you're not laboring for the Lord, then your hearing of his word was no better than the people that heard or didn't hear it at all. James explains this in greater detail. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, James writes, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. James says, looking at God's word, and not changing how you act, you forget what you read. He said, that's like looking in a mirror and forgetting what you saw. Imagine you went in, you looked in your mirror this morning, and there's this big black smudge all the way across your forehead. And then you just walked away and didn't do anything. Well, guess what? You still got a big black smudge all across your forehead. James says, uh, verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James says, look at the gospel and then fix what needs to be fixed. Change what needs to be changed. Do what needs to be done to take that black mark away. Uh, James goes on to talk about this more in chapter 2. Look at James 2, verse 19. He said, thou believest that there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. So the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us labor. Let us labor. Let us do the work, therefore, to enter into that rest. Let's look at our third lettuce. Lettuce number three, go down to Hebrews 4.14. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us hold fast our profession. What does it mean to hold fast our profession? Usually when we think of profession, we think of a job, but that's not what the Hebrew writer is saying here. He's not saying hang on to your job. Another definition of profession is an act of declaring that one has a particular feeling or quality. Some of the other English translations uh, translate this as hold on to your confession. And that's probably more what he's talking about here. Uh, 
<clears throat> Hebrews 4.14, he said, you confess Jesus as Lord of your life. Hold on to that. Keep him as the Lord of your life. Stay under the power of God. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Galatians 2.20. And Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul saying, I died to the old man. Paul was crucified to Christ. That's not Paul that's living anymore. Jesus is living in Paul. Paul was holding on to his profession that Jesus was the Lord of his life. One more thing to consider on this point. We're warned to hold on to our profession. That means there is a danger of letting it go. Look in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one to the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Look at that verse closely. It says, if someone gets caught up in sin, that we need to restore him. What does restore mean? Well, restore means take something back to its original condition. When you restore something, you make it back like it used to be. That means that that man was saved, now he's lost, but we need to bring him back. And look at that last part. It says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What does that mean? It means let us hold fast to our profession. Let us hang on to our confession. Let's keep on making sure that Jesus is the Lord of our life so we don't get pulled away. Let us, number four, let us pray. Now, that's not exactly what Hebrews 4.16 says, but that's the intended meaning. Look at Hebrews 4.16. The verse says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So how do we approach the throne? How do we come before God? In prayer. Prayer is our lifeline to God. It's our contact with the Heavenly Father. Look again, not only does it say we have access to the throne, it says, let us come boldly unto the throne. How many of you would go to the White House and just walk into the president's office? But well, you couldn't because, first of all, you have to get tickets to get a tour. They won't even let you in the gate to get to the White House. If you're on the White House tour, uh, you start walking towards the president's office, you can't get in without an invitation. You have to be invited. You have to be on the list. You have to have the right credentials. Now, what if the president were your father? Uh, we've seen lots of examples where presidents would have younger children. And they'd just be wandering all around the White House. They'd come and go. They could walk right into the Oval Office and nobody's going to say a word. Why? Because they're the children of the father. They're the children of the president. We can go boldly before our Heavenly Father because we're his children. That tells us that we can approach God with confidence. We can go boldly. It not only tells us how we can approach God, it tells us why we need to approach God. Look at verse 16 again. It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We've done things that can't be undone. We need mercy. We can't do it good enough to do good enough. We need grace. And God knows that we need mercy and God knows that we need grace. And he's given us an open pathway to the throne through prayer. And he's even provided the connection. Look at the book of Romans. Romans 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. It says we can go boldly before the throne of God and that Jesus is there on our side. He's helping us out. He's making intercession for us. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2, verse 1, has the same thought. John writes, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
An advocate is a lawyer. It's somebody that's pleading our case before the Father. We need mercy. We need grace. We have Jesus willing to take our needs before the Father, so therefore, let us pray. Let us, number five, let us encourage. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 this time. Hebrews chapter 10, repeat some of the things we've already said. Look at uh, verse 22. It says, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then the Hebrew writer repeats uh, his charge to pray. Uh, let us draw near with a true heart. Verse 23 let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So he reminds us once again, let us hold on to that promise. Then look at the next verse, and this is let us number five. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. What does that mean, let us consider one another? If you consider somebody, you're thinking about them. That's what he's talking about. Let's think about each other. Don't be thinking about yourself. Think about your brothers and sisters. To what? To provoke. What does provoke mean? Well, it can mean to aggravate, but here it means to encourage. You're provoking them. You're encouraging them. What are you encouraging them to? To love and good works. So basically, basically this is saying we need to be thinking about each other to encourage each other to be loving and to do good works. How can we do that? Well, if I'm thinking about the needs of my brethren, how can I encourage them to show love? How can I encourage them to do good works? Well, look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more, the more as you see the day approaching. We can't encourage somebody if we're not with them. We don't see them. If we don't gather with them, then we can't encourage anybody. We can't receive encouragement from anybody. We have to be assembled. We have to come together. Uh, so let us take every opportunity we're offered to encourage our brothers and sisters to love and to good works. And finally, let us, number six, let us run the race. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 for this one. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Actually, there are two lettuces in that passage. The first one says, let us lay aside every weight and sin. And the second one says, let us run the race. What does it mean to lay aside our weights and sins? I don't think we realize a lot of times that could be two totally different things. Yeah, sin is a burden that weighs us down, but sometimes we can have burdens and weights that, that are not sins. Uh, a lot of times when athletes are training, they'll wear ankle weights and wrist weights on their bodies to, to help with their movement. And then when they run the race, they'll take those off. When daddy was doing rehab, he had ankle weights that he would use to do his exercises. One Wednesday night, we were coming back into the house and he's having a little bit more trouble than usual with the steps. And that's when I realized I forgot to take his ankle weights off. He'd been wearing those all day. They were weighing him down. He couldn't do it like he normally could because he was still wearing the weights. We were supposed to take those off before he started running the race, before he started doing his activities. And that's what the Hebrew writers here are saying is, let us lay aside the weights and the sins. But there's some weights that are not necessarily sin. It's not a sin to love and support your family. It's not a sin to have a job, to enjoy your job, to work hard at your job. It's not a sin to enjoy recreational activities. But if we let any of those things get in the way of us running our Christian race, then they become weights and burdens that are weighing us down. We can't allow even good things to come between us and doing what God expects us to do. And what he expects us to do is to run the race that is set before us. Paul uses that race analogy again. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. In most races, there's only one winner. But in our Christian race, in running the race that God wants us to run, 
Everybody that finishes is a winner. It's kind of like our current marathons. Everybody that finishes a marathon gets a medal. Uh, Christ won the marathon. He was the first one to finish. He went through this world and died and rose again and went to heaven. He was first. He's waiting for us at the finish line to award all of us to finish the race. Let us run the race. To finish the race, we've got to keep on, keep it on. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is reaching the end of his life and he's writing to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is, hand, is at hand. Now look carefully at these next verses. Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Paul was strong to the finish, and he anticipated the crown that had awaited him at the gates of heaven. That was the finish line. Paul's a great example of faith for us, and he had great examples of faith for him. Remember, he, go back to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What witnesses was the Hebrew writer talking about? That's Hebrews 12, 1. What comes right before Hebrews 12? Hebrews 11, the faith hall of fame. And he's just talked about people like Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joseph and Rahab. And then he wrote, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. He said, since we have all those great examples of people of faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now look at the next verse. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Stay focused on Jesus. But before you can run the Christian race, you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. And God's word is clear about how that happens. The Lord adds those that are being saved to his church. And what you do today is no different than what the people did on the day the church was established on Pentecost in Acts 2. They heard the gospel. They believed what they heard. They realized that they were sinners and didn't want to live that way anymore. So they repented of that sin. They confessed Jesus as the Lord of their lives. Some of them even sold all their possessions and gave them to the apostles to distribute to the other people. They were baptized for the remission of their sin. If you've never started your Christian walk, you can do that this morning. For those of us who've already obeyed the gospel, uh, let's heed the instructions of the Hebrew writer. Let us fear God. Let us labor in his vineyard. Let us hold fast to our profession of faith. Let us pray for one another. Let us encourage one another. Let us run the race that's set before us. If you need a little help with your lettuce crop this morning, we'd love to pray with you and for you. Won't you come right now? We stand together as we sing.